welcome to Shelter Cove Online. We are so glad that you're joining us today for this sermon. We hope and pray that this message encourages you, that you learn something, that you enjoy it. But more than that, we just pray that God would move in your life, that he would reveal some more of himself to you today. If you would like to respond to this message in any way, you can contact us at sheltercovelive.com. Have an amazing rest of your day. Isn't that awesome to see that video? People from Modesto Gospel Mission shopping because you guys gave $10,000 to provide gifts for kids that normally don't get them. Come on. I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. You can see those gifts outside in the ministry mall. They're all nicely laid out there. Again, it's your generosity that's providing gifts for foster kids, homeless kids, kids that normally don't get a gift at Christmas. And we're just going to smother them with the love of Jesus through, through a present this year. So hundreds of families are getting impacted. And again, I just want to say thank you so much for your generosity. Speaking of generosity, Christmas is a great time and a great opportunity for us to be generous. And you can do that in so many different ways. One of the things I do want to highlight is our year-end giving goals. And there's three things that we want to do. We want to ignite compassion, unleash joy, and anticipate the future. When it comes to igniting compassion, we want to do what we're, we're doing. We want to give these gifts to these kids, $10,000 partnering with Modesto Gospel Mission to make that happen. Also another $10,000 to the Modesto Pregnancy Center. They do a great job, very pro-life, encouraging moms and and husbands and men to, to choose life. And so we want to do that. And then we want to unleash joy. Uh, we want to do that by giving $5,000 towards Night to Shine. It is the party of the year for our special needs community in February. In fact, so many people look forward to that uh, during the entire year. And we want to bless a group of people that are often overlooked and undervalued. So we want to do that. And then another $15,000 towards our light show. It costs a lot of money to, to pull that off. A lot of people hearing the gospel, being ministered to. So I appreciate you guys giving in a way that will impact that. And then lastly, we want to anticipate the future. God's doing so many great things here. We've got, uh, at the 10 o'clock, we got a venue upstairs uh, in the loft. That room upstairs is used just about every single day during the week. And the floor is starting to crack. Uh, technology is outdated. The lighting, we can't get the replacement parts for. So we are definitely uh, overdue for an update up there. And that's going to be about $85,000. And then in another $50,000 towards some future expansion and needs as they arise. So overall goal for December, uh, $500,000, half a million. That's a ton of money, but nothing's impossible with God. Amen. And so here's my, my request is that every single one of us would just pray. Pray about a one-time gift above and beyond our normal giving. And for some of you, that may only be $5, others $20, $100. Some of you, it's $10,000 because you have been beyond blessed. But I'm sure and I'm confident that as we pray and do our part, God's going to take the little that we give. He'll multiply it and provide for every single one of our needs. So let me pray for our offering, our giving. You can give through the year-end giving envelopes and the seat backs in front of you. You can hop online, drop down menu, year-end gift, and I'm excited to see what God's going to do. God, we love you. And... It's because you first loved us. And God, as we give, God, would you take these offerings, these acts of generosity, would you multiply them? And would you expand your kingdom? We promise to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. God, I pray that you would minister to our hearts right now, that you would soften our hearts, that we would not only hear your word, that we would receive it, but also live it out. And we know that's only possible with the help of your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would speak through me with clarity and passion. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, hey, if you have your Bibles, meet me in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. One of our ushers will get one to you in just a moment. If we have not yet met, my name is Jeremy, one of the pastors here. I would love to meet you after the service. I'll be hanging out in the ministry mall. If this is your first time here, I just want to say welcome. So glad that you're here with us today. Also want to give a shout out to those of you joining us online. Great to have you tuning in with us today as well. We are in a three-week series titled More Than a Holiday. 
where we're looking at Christmas and it's so much more than Santa Claus, so much more than the reindeer elves, so much more than Hallmark Christmas movies, so much more than the giving and receiving of gifts. And last week we looked at uh, just the birth of Jesus and how Jesus is so much more than a baby. And we've looked at the reality that Jesus is the Savior, he is the Christ, and he is the Lord. And today what we're looking at is we're looking at this birth of Jesus is so much more than a miracle. So much more than a miracle. In fact, if you're taking notes, you can fill this in. Christmas is a reminder to trust God. Christmas is a reminder to trust God. That's, that's really So much of what Christmas is, is is, is a reminder for us to put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, how do we do that? What does that look like? I believe that there's three areas where we can trust God. Number one is to trust God's plan. To trust God's plan. Now, this is what it says in Luke chapter one, starting in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So here you have Mary and Joseph. They're betrothed to get married. And in that day, it was like a a legal engagement. In other words, to, to break that off, you would literally have to divorce your spouse. And we see clearly that Joseph is from uh, the lineage, the line of King David. And then in verse 28, the angel comes and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Uh, I love this because Mary most likely didn't feel favored. She was one of six Marys that we see in the New Testament, very common name. She was a female, she was poor, she was young, and yet it says that she was favored by God. Now, what does that mean? It means that she was graced by God. What is grace? Well, grace comes from God. It's undeserved. It's unmerited. It's it's something that, we can receive, and it's something that we cannot earn. Now, God's grace is upon Mary, not because of anything that she did, not because of her character, but because God chose her. And then in verse 31, this is what it says. It says, and behold, the angel will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And here you got the Jews. They've been waiting over 400 years. God's been silent, waiting for the Messiah, waiting for the promised Savior. Gabriel shows up and says, Mary, I'm gonna, God's gonna provide the Messiah through you. You're the chosen one. You're you're." the one who's been graced. And isn't that how God works? He works in ways that we don't expect. You know, I love Isaiah 55. God says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts, declares the Lord. I look at stories in the Bible. God would often use the least likely person. Think about Goliath. Who killed him? A nine foot tall person. It was a little shepherd boy, David, with a stone. Uh, I think about the feeding of the thousands. What did God use? A little boy that had a little bit of bread, a little bit of fish, and he feeds thousands of people. That's why I, my favorite Christmas movie is guess. On the count of three, I want you to guess my favorite Christmas movie. One, two, three. Die Hard. I knew somebody was going to say Die Hard. That's awesome. Uh, it's Rudolph. And here's why. Not because of the abominable snowman. It's because Rudolph is the one that couldn't fly very well. Rudolph was the odd one out. Rudolph was the one with the shiny nose that everyone made fun of. Rudolph was the one that was the least likely to lead Santa's sleigh. And that's how God works. He uses the least likely. He works in the least likely ways. And then what does Mary say in verse 34? 
And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She must, she must have been freaked out. She must have been filled with fear. She must have been, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of the criticism. What do people talk about me? What if they look down on me? What if they're negative about me? What if they want nothing to do with me? Fear of rejection. What if my friends leave me? What if Joseph leaves me? What if my parents don't believe me? Fear of being inadequate. My man, I'm too, I'm too young. I don't know how to do this. I mean, fear of the unknown. What are all the things that are going to happen to me? And if you and I aren't careful, we can live life with those very same fears. Fear of the unknown, fear of rejection, fear of criticism, and fear of inadequacy. And where does that often come out? When we want to share our faith. When we tell, want to tell people about Jesus, when we want to share a story, when we, we want to just talk about the goodness of Jesus Christ, we think, man, what, what, what do people criticize me? What do people reject me? Uh, what if people, I, I just feel inadequate. What if somebody asks me a question about the Bible I don't have the answer to? Uh, I, I just feel so, what about the unknown? What, what if, in our whole life can be, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? Mary was like, how is this possible? Because... I, I'm a virgin. Here's what fear is. F-E-A-R. It's false evidence appearing real. And if we're not careful, we can get so caught up in focusing on what, what could go wrong instead of what could go right if we trust God. Boy, because this is an opportunity to trust God's plan. How is this possible? Because I'm a virgin. Zachariah who is Elizabeth's husband. Who is Elizabeth? It was Mary's cousin. Uh, they were both older. Zachariah says uh, earlier in the chapter, after he finds out that his wife is pregnant, how is this possible? Because I am old and my wife is advanced in years. Gentlemen, take note. He did not call her old. He called her advanced in years. Some of you guys, that's the one thing you need to write down today. Advanced in years, not old. <laughs> Sometimes it's not the absence of fear. <laughs> I'm glad somebody got a good laugh out of that. That was good. Sometimes it's not the absence of fear. Sometimes it's just the reality that our faith is greater than our fear. Now, some of you might be thinking, you know what? It'd be nice if I had an angel just show up to me, wouldn't it? It'd be nice if Gabriel just showed up and told me what was going to happen. You know what's the hardest to trust God is when you don't know where he's leading you. It's like when you're walking in the dark and the only thing you can hold on to is his hand and listen to his voice. When I was uh, younger, I used to get up and I would, in the middle of the night, I have to go to the bathroom. I would literally walk past the bathroom and I would go and wake up my mom and I would say, mom, I've got to go to the bathroom. And she would know the drill. She would stand outside the door. She would wait till I was going to go, go into the bathroom. She would tuck me in and go back to bed. Aww. Now, I, w I was young. I was like five, six, seven. Teen. Um, I was a younger kid when this was going on, but here's why I knew that if, as long as my mom was there, as long as she was present, everything was going to be fine. So you don't need to know where God's leading you. You just need to know that God's with you. It's the presence of God. When God told Joshua, Joshua, I want you to take over for Moses, he didn't tell him everything that was going to happen. He just said, Joshua, don't be afraid, be strong and courageous because the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. The disciples, the same thing. Hey, this is what I want you to do. I'm not gonna tell you every challenge you're gonna face, but go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, teaching them to obey. Surely I will be with you wherever you go. What do we need? We need to be reminded today that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have the presence of Jesus inside us through the Holy Spirit. Trust God's plan. What's his greatest plan for every single one of us is that Jesus Christ would be our savior. That's why Jesus came. Jesus came and was born to die as the savior of the world. Why? Because that's our greatest need. We talked about it last week, that we all need a savior. That's plan A. The next thing that God wants us to do is not just be a follower, but make other followers. That's why he tells us to go and make disciples. But Christmas is a reminder to trust God. How do we trust him? We trust God's plan. Second of all, we trust God's power. We trust God's power. You know, Mary's saying, hey, I don't, I don't get the bi biology here. Um, and Gabriel's gonna say it's a miracle. This is what Gabriel says. 
Gabriel says, and the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. I love that. Will overshadow you. What does that mean? It means that you're gonna experience the presence of God. So what it means to overshadow. We see this in the Old Testament. Uh, we see this with the tabernacle. What happened? Uh, God would show up. He would overshadow and his presence was there, was there. We see this in the transfiguration of Jesus when Jesus was with Peter, James, and John. Who shows up? Moses and Elijah. Why Moses and Elijah? Representing the law and the prophets. And it says that the glory of Jesus was revealed. He was transfigured. Why? Because the presence of God was there. Mary, you're gonna experience the presence of God in your life. And here's what we see. We see one of the foundations, the fundamentals to the Christian faith, and that's the virgin birth. How, how do we know it was a virgin birth? Well, simply because the Bible says so. There's a fulfilled prophecy in Isaiah chapter 7, 14. It says that the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. We see this because the person writing this book, Luke himself was a doctor. What did Luke know? He knew about the birds and the bees and how babies came to be, right? We see this because of Mary's testimony herself, her own words that she was a virgin. We see this because this is just one of many miracles that God did. We see miracles throughout the Old Testament. We see miracles throughout the New Testament. Constantly in the Bible, where Jesus would heal the lame, heal the blind, heal the sick, uh, people would experience forgiveness. Only God could do that. He would raise somebody from the dead. He himself would rise from the dead. And if we struggle to believe the virgin birth, we're gonna struggle to believe the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Miracle of Jesus, why? Because he's got power. The question is, is just do we believe this? That's the question Mary had to ask. Is, do, I, do I really believe this? And this is what it says in verse 36. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age, age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. In other words, the angel saying to Mary, Mary, you're not alone. You think God just does powerful things in your life? <laughs> no, that's, he does powerful things in people's lives all the time. In fact, your cousin, Elizabeth, who she thought was too old and, and barren, no, she's gonna be with child as well. Who is she with child with? John the Baptist. What was the point of John the Baptist? John the Baptist was to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. So here you've got Elizabeth and Mary, what does God provide? He provides community. One of the greatest things in the Christian life is not to be alone because you realize when you're around other followers of Jesus Christ, you're not the only one with problems. Everybody has a problem. Can I get an amen? You say amen. You don't need to look at your neighbor and be like, amen. They got lots of problems next to me. But the power of community. See, it's interesting because Gabriel shows up to Mary and Elizabeth. Both of them had powerful sons, John the Baptist and Jesus. Both of them were not supposed to get pregnant. Here's Elizabeth. She's too old. Here's Mary. She's a virgin. For Elizabeth, it was too late. And one of the greatest lies that the enemy will tell you is that it's too late. It's too late for you to be the person God wants you to be. It's too, it's too late for you to truly experience peace and joy in your life. It's too late for you to experience financial freedom. It's too late for you, for you to really start serving and getting involved in the church. It's one of the greatest lies that he will tell you. Another great lie is, hey, you're the only one that's going through that. And that's why community is so important because we're reminded that we are not alone. Christmas is a reminder to trust God to trust his plan, to trust his power, and thirdly, to trust his possibilities. To trust his possibilities. This is what it says in verse 37. Gabriel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. Read that with me. For nothing will be impossible with God. One more time. For nothing will be impossible to, with God. 
Now, it's one thing to know that. It's another thing to believe that. You know, when I was younger, there's a, a friend of mine. His name was Rob. And uh, Rob was quite a bit older. Um, I think he was in his, his 20s. Um, but he had this crush on this gal named Jennifer. And he really liked Jennifer. And uh, he decided to ask her out on a date. And so he asked her out and she said, nope. <laughs> he didn't give up. He asked her out a second time. Nope, third time, nope, fourth time, nope, fifth time, nope, sixth time, nope. Now you would think after getting rejected six times, you would be like, all right, maybe God has somebody else in store, not Rob. Seventh time, yes. They went out and later they got married. Why? Because he was a guy that refused to believe in the impossible. He, he, he believed that God could do all things. Now, single guys, let me just clarify something. Feel free to do that. But if you get arrested for stalking somebody, do not blame your pastor, all right? But he was persistent. He did not give up. Why? Because all things are possible for those who believe. You know, I think about Jesus. Jesus said with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. In Genesis 18, 14, God said to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at an appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. This is after they had been trying to have a child for years. They were old in age. Jeremiah says, nothing is too hard for you. God can do all things except one. It is impossible for God to lie. What does that mean? It means the one person you and I can trust is God. The one person that we can depend on is God. The one person we can give our life to is God. The one person who will never change is God because God will never lie. And then verse 38, what's Mary's response? Mary says, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I love this because serving isn't just something we do. A servant is who we are. Mary realizes, hey, my identity is serving God. I'm a servant of the Lord. What does that mean? That means, God, whatever you want, whatever you have in store, whatever your plan, whatever your purpose, God, it's not about me. It's not about my life. It's about serving you. I'm gonna accept it. You know, we we pray, you know, Father, your, your will be done. Um, not will you change your will, right? Your, your will be done in my life. And here's the difference between faithful people and unfaithful people, because at the end of the day, Mary chose to be faithful. Unfaithful people give up at the first sign of difficulty. Again, unfaithful people, they just give up. At the first time that something is difficult or hard, they give up. You know what faithful people do? Faithful people are determined, Faithful people are diligent. Faithful people are persistent. Faithful people do not know how to quit. And what would it look like for God to work in your heart in such a way today where you say, God, I've been unfaithful, but I just want to be faithful today? Because I believe most of it is attitude. I love what Charles Swindoll said. He put it this way. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures, than success, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. Next slide. It will make or break a company, a church, a home. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people act in a certain way, amen. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have and that is our attitude. And then he ends with this. I am convinced that life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. So it is with you. We are all in charge of our attitudes. What sticks out in the life of Mary is her attitude. What's Christmas? It's a reminder to trust God, to trust God's plan, to trust God's power, to trust God's possibilities. Now, in your notes, where do you need to trust him the most? I believe it's two areas. Number one, it's when you're surprised. 
when you're caught off guard, when life throws you a curveball, when something out of left field happens, all of us are one phone call away from our lives radically changing. And then second of all, it's when you are not in control of other people, of a situation, something you can't change because there's nothing you can do about it. And some of you, you're in the middle of that right now. You're in the middle of a situation where you've been surprised and you're not in control and God's just saying, trust me. That's what I'm in the middle of right now myself. You know, some of you uh, may know my story. I married my wonderful wife, Kelly, 22 years ago. Uh, one of the greatest decisions I've made besides giving my life to Jesus Christ. Um, 18 years ago, we had our first child, Jacob. Uh, Jacob uh, is a blessing to us. Jacob does have severe special needs. He doesn't walk, he doesn't talk, he doesn't eat through his mouth. Um, when he was born for the first six weeks, we didn't know whether he was gonna make it, live, die. The first year was very tough. Um, so difficult that Kelly said, hey, I don't, I don't I don't think I can go through another pregnancy, have another biological child. And I, I listened to her, just loved her uh, over time. I just said, hey, I want to step in, out in faith. I don't want to live with regret the rest of my life being I didn't trust God. And so we stepped out in faith. We got pregnant right away with Drew. Drew's now 16 years old, super healthy. My wife was like, that's enough. Uh, done. We prayed about adopting. We, we went to uh, Stockton. Uh, and uh, took some classes up there. We were waiting and waiting and waiting to adopt a child, and out of left field, God provided a child um, through my cousin. She was 16 years old at the time, and uh, we have Hallie, who's 12, who is a part of my blood, and uh, God's been uh, really good and really gracious to our family. It was about uh, two months ago, my wife was doing some intermittent fasting. I don't know if you know what that is. It's where you get to eat like for a six or seven hour window each day, and then you can't eat at all. Sounds super lame. I probably will never do that in my life. Um, but she was doing that, and she's like, I just don't feel the grace. I'm like, then stop. Don't do it. So she stopped, and like a week later, she's like, I still feel just nauseous. I just don't feel right. And she's all, I'm going to go take a pregnancy test. And I laughed. I'm like, sweetheart. You know, I had my vasectomy three years ago. Like, uh, I had the snip snip. Like, I, go ahead, you can do it. So she goes to the dollar store and gets uh, a really good pregnancy test. It's her high quality there and comes home and she takes it right away. It's positive. And I'm like, say what? And I just, start, I just start laughing. And she's like, Jared, come with me right now to Walgreens. We're getting a good one. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Well, we'll go to Walgreens. And she's like, you pick one out. I don't want anybody to see us over here. I'm like, okay, I'll pick one out. I'm like, you do know somebody from Shelter Cove is gonna see us in Walgreens, right? She's like, oh, just get one. So I pick one out, get one, turn the corner. Hey, Pastor Jeremy. I'm like, hey, how are you? Yeah, good deal. Nothing, nothing going on here. Just kind of hanging out with the wife, you know? Uh, and so we bought the pregnancy test, um, took it home. She took it right away positive again. I'm like... Sweetheart, can I just ask you a, just a random question? Have you done anything with anybody lately that I should know about? And she's all, chair, no. You know I wouldn't do that, and if I did, I would have told you, but no, I'm like, I know, I know, I know. She's like, if you want to go che get checked out, you, you can go get checked out. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't need to do that. And I started thinking, okay, this really did happen. It could happen again. And if there are still swimmers on the swim team, then we might need to figure out like what's going on. So I went, got checked and tur turns out there are still just a few Michael Phelps swimming around in there, you know? <laughs> and so I was like, wow, uh, okay. There's still a couple little engines that could going on. And so here's the reality, church. I'm 47. My wife is 44. And we are with child. We are expecting a little baby. Yeah, no retirement for me. Yep, I'll be working until I'm 150. Yeah, I've already thought about all the jokes, you know. The kid's like, hey, uh, let's go visit dad at his home. What home? Convalescent home, all right? Um, 
People will ask me, you know, Jeremy, how are you feeling overall? <laughs> Pretty strong, you know? <laughs> so, some people don't know what to say. They, you know, congratulations, sorry. Uh, it's great. What do you say to me? Just call me stud. That's all you need to say. Hey, stud. Um, here's the crazy thing about this. My wife Kelly's biggest fear biggest nightmare is this. And here's why. Good chance that we could have another special needs child. Another chance with a child with chromosome disorder. For a while, she was just so embarrassed. She didn't want to tell anybody. And I'm like, don't be. And she's like, well, it's all your fault. And I'm like, look in the mirror, girlfriend. It is your fault. You know, in fact, it was uh, after, right around Thanksgiving, I just told her, sweetie, I'm so thankful for you. She looked back at me and said, I'm not very thankful for you right now. <laughs> She's just went, been, been dealing with just a lot of concerns of, of what could go wrong. And it's been a great opportunity for me to encourage her. I still get nervous and I'm scared. And yet I've been, my prayer has just been, God, I trust you. God, I don't even need to tell you what I want, what I think, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I just, I just trust you. More recently, I've been just um, praying for a healthy little baby. And it's, it's crazy because for, for such a long time, we had Hallie, and I always thought it'd be great to have another little girl. And uh, it's like God's like, Jeremy, I remember that prayer because we're gonna have a little girl, which is unbelievable and amazing considering I didn't think I could have a child. Talked to my doctor that did the surgery on me. <laughs> <laughs> laugh it up, folks. No, um, I laugh for like four weeks, you know? Um, but she's like, yeah, there's like a one in 2,000 chance this happens. I'm like, I'm, I'm the one in 2,000 right here. Um, so far, we've, we've gone to appointments at six weeks, eight weeks, 12 and a half weeks, which was Friday. And so far, everything looks great. Kelly's 12 and a half weeks pregnant, which is something to praise the Lord for. Now, at 20 weeks, we're gonna have some more tests and some more ultrasounds, and it could reveal that there's challenges and everything could be okay. But what are we doing right now? Just trust in the Lord. What are we trusting? His plan, his power, his possibilities. And, uh, you know, it'll be great because I'll get the senior discount when she's in high school. <laughs> we'll get a breakfast, get a little bit, of, little bit of a discount. Here's what I've been reminded of. So I'm not in control. You think you're in control. You think you call the shots. You don't. God does. And either we can trust his plan or we can fight against his plan. You know what's been the blessing to me is having people in my life, friends, family members, they're just praying for us that are come alongside us. Um, told our life group, our life group is unbelievable. And just the love and the support that we have is, is absolutely amazing. So here's the question um, that I want to leave for you today and make it personal because that's where I need to trust God. But where do you need to trust God? Where in your life do you need to trust God? Where in your life do you need to share what's going on? So you got some people in your life like us that will just love you, come alongside you. They're not going to judge you, not going to criticize you, but they're going to lift you up in prayer. Where in your life are you maybe a little bit embarrassed? Hey, I'm embarrassed to share this struggle, this sin. Don't be. If you are, I, I get it. But we'd love to come alongside you and love you and encourage you during this season. Why? Because Christmas is a reminder to trust God, to trust his plan, to trust his power, and to trust his possibilities. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thanks for being so good. And God, I know I'm not the only one that's in a season of really needing to just lean into you and trust you. 
God, for those that are here that are just trusting you for, for a spouse, trusting you for a child, trusting you for a friend, trusting you financially, trusting you in a health issue, God, would you just infuse and strengthen our faith today, knowing that we are all in this together. God, different challenges, different opportunities, different situations, different circumstances, but at the end of the day, we all have something in common, and that's that we all need Jesus. So Jesus, would you just be real to us this Christmas? and Give us the faith to trust you. Give us the faith like Mary to say, may it be to me as you have said, because I am your servant. If you're here today and you don't yet have a personal relationship with Jesus, boy, you can surrender your life to him right now. You can receive the greatest gift of Christmas, which is Jesus Christ himself. You can do that through a prayer, a prayer that simply goes something like this. Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner in need of a savior. There's nothing I can do to get right with God. So God, would you receive me? Because I receive you. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your grace. I repent from my sin. And I ask that you would make me into the person you want me to be. And I give you total control of my life today. Because I want to be saved from my sin. I want to be right with God. I want to know that I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with you. And the only way that's possible is through Jesus Christ. God, thank you for the way that you are moving in our hearts and lives today. Help us to trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 